This is Macro Analytics, delivering frank conversations on global macroeconomics and market analysis outside the mainstream, featuring discussions and debates between Gordon T. Long, publisher and editor of GordonTLong.com and his guests. The content of this discussion is strictly the opinion of the participants. It is in no way a solicitation for business, nor is it to be considered investment advice of any sort. Always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decision. These discussions are extremely hard-hitting and terribly frank, and parental discretion is advised. Now, on to the show. Good morning. I'm Gord Long with GordonTLong.com, and I have with me this morning Charles Hugh Smith, very familiar to all of our listeners, a well-recognized writer on the web who is the publisher of the website of twominds.com. Good morning, Charles. Welcome back this month. Thank you, Gordon. Glad to be here. Amazing how quickly the month goes, isn't it? Yes. And I can, I can tell you it's been a – living here in Boston, it's been a, um, a, historic, um, a historic period of time. You know, we're just – obviously with the Boston Marathon, everything associated with it, but – some of the things that you know we went through of completely shutting down experience I've never never seen before, never experienced before. I don't know what your what your perceptions were from the West Coast, but well, it was certainly um, a unique uh, period of of history, and uh, you know the first uh, sort of terrorist uh, event in, in quite a while. Very very upsetting for us here and innocent people, and you know there's a place where I spend a lot of time. So it's been a, a busy time, Charles. I wanted to. Uh, this morning is to springboard, as we had said to our, our listeners previously, the last month we talked about a market clearing event. We put six questions on the table that I, as a reminder, I have them up here that we didn't try to really answer, but we raised them that were indicative and we discussed them of why we will need a market clearing event to reestablish pricing uh, so that we'll come out of this from a growth because of the amount of malinvestment and mis mispricing that um, that we have. And what I wanted to do this morning is to springboard from that because one of the things that comes out of it is the fact, and it's my personal opinion, that we've reached the point of peak consumption here in the United States, not necessarily around the world, but certainly in the United States. And I'd like to go through it maybe in four parts, um, Charles. One is just make sure everybody understands the current uh, level of consumption here in the United States and, and how it's put together, uh, how we arrive at that. Uh, how did we get to such levels? Why has it peaked? And why is this level actually unsustainable? Because as, as obvious as some of this is, very few people, I think, really give a lot of thought to it. I did a, a multi-part show with uh, Ty Andrews, uh, Charles, a while ago. It's on. It's in the li Macro Analytics Library on why, in fact, the GDP formula itself is flawed. It is a very, very poor um, methodology, and I think it's even dated. And it certainly doesn't work when you get to the extent uh, when some of the elements of it get as large as they do, it distorts the uh, the formula. But we don't re revisit it. And I'm not going to get into that and deflators here this morning. But I have the formula up here for those that aren't familiar with it. And it says when you come up with gross domestic product, the accepted measure of growth, it consists of C, which stands for consumption, I, which is investment, G for government, and then the net of exports subtracting the imports that you come up for your growth. And as you can see in the table below, in the United States right now, our consumption level is 70, just under 71% of that total GDP that we're, we're consuming. On a $15.9 trillion per year of GDP, 11.2 is just outright consumption. That is significant by any stretch of the imagination. Wouldn't you agree, Charles? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I know that when we look at some of these elements, if we were to compare those to other countries, it really stands out. If you go through all the other countries, you'll find that even the most developed countries are usually in the range of 50 to 55 percent. You will see the uh, some of the developing countries typically down south of 35 percent, but somewhere in that in that level. Because when you have that amount of consumption, it's not being put into savings. And when you're not savings, you don't have money for that I for that investment. And then also it says, where does the money for the G come from if it has to come from taxation? So what happens is you start to strangle your economy if the G gets uh, too big. I know you had some comments on um, what you've seen in China. 
with the C as in comparison to uh, to the G that we have right now for government? Yeah, it's um, I think it's uh, a, an interesting point of comparison that um, you can have too much and too little consumption. And so here in the States, as you say, 70 percent uh, is actually depriving our economy of productive investment. But in China, the private consumption is only 35 percent of their whole economy. And then the vast majority of their economy is so-called fixed assets, um, fixed investments, which uh, tend to be, you know, high-rise condominiums, you know, housing, um, infrastructure, and new malls, and so on. But a lot of that um, is is actually unproductive. In other words, if you build a, a million um, apartments that um, are unaffordable to 95% of the people, that they're sitting empty as as um, investments for the wealthy class, but they're not really um, generating a lot of value. That that that's a form of consumption, actually, uh, an empty house because it's not creating any value. There's no multiplier effect, and and so it's um and so that's the problem with not having enough consumption. Then you're you're taking the um the economy's control away from households to make their decisions of how to spend and invest. And you're, uh, you're taking it and putting it all in the hands of the government and uh, the government cartels. And so you, you can get in trouble from either side. And I think that's, that's the kind of lesson in, in your target uh, consumption of around 50, 55 percent. That's sort of the, uh, the, the, the middle ground that, that leads to um, good growth. From 2000, after the dot-com bubble and we lowered interest rates, we had, as we know, the housing bubble here in America. And it turned out that the vast majority of our GDP was actually going, was in housing and in HELOC loans, which are home equity loans, etc., as we built not only McMansions and Yuppie Palaces, but all of the add-ons that people were doing and financing vacations through the expansion of, of uh, home equity loans. Now, that's, that's fine, but that's consumption where it's, in fact, non-productive. You can have consumption that can, in fact, be a form of investment and lead to very positive things, but when it's just consumed and doesn't produce anything, um, it eventually will lead to, lead to problems, and that's what we've done. So we ha- when we thought we had good GDP, uh, good or at least good growth, it was false growth. And I think you refer to it often, Charles, as phantom growth. And we've been living in this phantom growth. And so th- these these formulas can be so misleading if we if we don't look at them if we don't look at them properly. Uh, obviously, like any formula. Yeah, I'd like to make one other quick point here, um, Gordon, which is that, uh, you know, the G component of, of GDP, the government spending, what's not included, of course, is whether the government borrowed the money that it is now spending. And so the, um, as we know, what happens when you keep borrowing and borrowing and borrowing, you have to pay interest. And that interest is a, is a, is a load or a weight on future income until the, um, until the debt's paid off or liquidated. So, you know, the, the, we can get GDP by um, the government borrowing vast sums of money and spending it. But uh, again, that, that can look like a malinvestment um, if it's not appropriately invested, if it's not generating a multiplier effect. And then, of course, most of our government spending is not generating a multiplier effect. So it, we're actually digging ourselves a debt hole to, to keep our GDP positive. Yeah, that's one of the many fallacies with this formula. As you correctly point out, government borrowing money increases the G, which makes GDP larger. And I'll, we'll show a little later on one of the charts where they, they've had to increase the G to keep the economy going and funding it because of the collapsing elements of investment and, 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 and trade. But that money, if it's put into productive uh, use, where in fact it's going to generate revenues and, and exports is positive, but it's not when it's simply used for non-productive. And a vast majority of it is transfer dollars, welfare that comes out in consumption. It's somewhat of a double accounting and it's just spent. It was whether it's welfare payments, food stamps, and I'm not commenting on the validity of the programs, but they're non-productive. Again, another element that completely distorts the formula. And to this point, right now, we've reached the point where the formula, frankly, is is completely meaningless in our, in our current environment. This is a lot more detail, which shows the changes, Charles, in each of the contributions. But in the last quarter, GDP just marginally grew here in Q4, with consumption 
contributing 1.3%, but it just wasn't offset by investment and, and export, which was a negative 1.41. So it's just, it's a sustaining, ongoing, secular environment that we've, we've put ourselves in. So the question, because how long can it, can it go on? Because you definitely can't go on too long or, or extensively because then the debt, as everybody's familiar with, debt to GDP just becomes unsustainable. The interest on the debt we can't carry. And that's why one of the reasons that we've had to force interest rates down so low, as you're well aware, Charles, it isn't so much to try and stimulate the economy. Yes, that's important and is critical to do. It's more that the government can't afford to pay those previous rates on the debt. The debt's got so large right now that it can't pay it. And if you look at Japan, for example, and I was kind of laughing at this in a another discussion I was I was in recently, uh, you know, their goal is to get their uh, inflation up to two percent inflation within two years. And if they were to do that and be successful, their interest rates would go up. If their interest rates go up by one percent, the total tax revenues is insufficient to pay the interest. So by definition, they're completely bust. And the bond market eventually is going to really react to that number as it some as it comes into vogue. But that's what we've already have. So we have people that have reached that that stage right now. So so how do we get to this level? And when you go through this list, what you see is the reasons we're here have all changed. One of the reasons we could support a 70% of consumption economy was we had always had high levels of employment. I don't think we have that anymore. We had a strong and a world class middle class. And um that's frankly, is not there anymore. Not at all. We have had years of domestic and foreign capital investment into the country, which even when so when our savings was falling off, we had so much foreign capital flowing in for investment. That's changed. That's not the case anymore. If corporations are investing, they're investing abroad. They're not investing domestically. And, and I'm referring to capital expenditures or CapEx, which is in total free fall. Um, as they're pulling in and not investing in America. We had low levels of per capita poverty. I don't think that's the case. We have 48 million people now on food stamps, etc. We were a dominant exporter because of our industrial strength uh, around the world. And with 44,000 factories having left America since 1999, it's indicative of us losing that dominance in, in our industrial position. Public policy did support private investment in business, and our public policy doesn't reflect that anymore. And we had low tax levels relatively. So the the things that got us here right off the bat would suggest um, that they've all changed, and I would say has changed substantially. Yeah, I totally agree, Uh, Gordon. I'd like to make a couple of quick points here. Um, When I think about the past decades of, of rapid growth and strong income growth, like the 1950s and 1960s, what I think of was that, of course, it was the post-World War II era when um, our competitor uh, developed nations, uh, their e- economies, their industrial economies had been destroyed by bombing and, and years of war. So the U.S. had a unique situation where our industrial base had been um, rapidly expanded during the war. And so we were really sitting in um, the, the ideal situation of our industrial base was um, relatively new and it was um, unimpaired. And so we could supply the world with uh, industrial goods. And the other thing that uh, was occurring in those decades was productivity was rising. You know, there was a lot of managerial innovations um, as a result of the war. And there was um, a lot of industrial and technological innovations. And so that that those in, increased our productivity greatly. And when you increase productivity, you get higher wages. With higher wages, then you can have increased consumption. Now we have sort of punky or stagnant productivity. And um, we have a lot of competitors in the world now that we didn't have uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And, and I see the economy as being... Um, the cost of living was was substantially lower in those years. Your dollar went a lot farther. And so now people are spending more money to get less than they did 20, 30 years ago. Precisely. Well, unsound money has, has done that. And, we've, and a lot of the industries have, have disappeared because of that. For example, uh, the services industries of repair. 
And we used to have people like cobblers who repaired shoes. We had people, maintenance people repairing refrigerators and stoves and sort of thing. We still have that, but it's a very small amount because we are a throwaway materialistic society. It's cheaper to buy a new one than, than repair it and all the jobs that go with it. And the reason that's changed, we call it inflation. It's actual, in fact, because we have a dramatically overstated U.S. dollar. That should be lower, but so these distortions, mispricing, misinvest, malinvestment have have just spread like a cancer through our society. You know, if we take in all the flips of this, it says why these consumption levels have peaked, but it, it's actually more than that, because we've had some profound structural changes in here. We've had crushing post-secondary educational costs in the United States, and you've shown many times some just how dramatic that that has been. And so in the last 10, 12 years, the average American family have went where education and for their children was, was something they planned for it now to being something that is just out of control. It is, it is threatening retirement to families who've got two kids or three and, and also that, you know, just not an undergraduate anymore. There's postgraduate education. So it's a protracted, expensive educational structure of, of, of money that's never been there before. That's, that's crushing the ability to consume that's cr- crushing consumption. Um, and it's been subtle. We all talk about it. We don't realize that, that it's happened in 10 or 12 years quietly. Um, and it, therefore is changing the patterns of consumption. We've just as much, we've had a shift from defined benefits to contributory benefits. And, there, and therefore, basically pensions have gone away. So now, unless you're a government employee, you don't have a pension and you can't save enough really to, to self fund a pension to the degree the current cost of living merits it. So the days of retiring at 65 and being comfortable, the people I talk to that are in their 40s right now, they're, that, I can see the panic in their eyes. There's no way they can see what's going to happen after they get their kids through college. And even if they could save $100,000, it isn't going to fund their pension. That is dramatic. That's putting a crimp on consumption. We've got elevated costs for housing itself. The level, even though we've had a correction in housing somewhat, it's still dramatic levels of what we're paying for uh, for housing. Comments on those three? Uh, yeah, I, I think that one of the key points that your um, that your slide brings up to me is the diminishing return on on our consumption. In other words, uh, take the college education; um, it's uh, quadrupled, basically adjusted for inflation. So you have a college education that used to cost forty thousand now costs one hundred and sixty thousand. Is it four times better? Is that, is the graduate have four times greater ability to get a job? Are they four times more knowledgeable? Well, we all know the answer is no. The yield on the knowledge gained is, is unchanged or perhaps even stagnant compared to what it was 20 years ago. Your kids aren't learning anymore and they're not getting better prepared for the workforce. They may even be getting less prepared for the workforce than they were 20 years ago. So we're spending more, but we're getting less. And you can, and you can go down the line on everything you've mentioned here. And that's the case. Diminishing return. You know, you're, you're spending a quarter million for a house. It's still providing the same thing it did 20 years ago for half the price adjusted. You know, it's still a shelter, still has a garage and so on. But, it, you know, it doesn't, it's, um, the, the, the return on that investment is, is tremendously lower. And I'm um, same with healthcare. You know, we're spending, um, four times as much on healthcare. Are we four times healthier? No. Exactly. And how are this cascades when you've got this level of student education debt? So you're now a student and you're graduating and you, let's say you're carrying $150,000, which used to be the size of a major mortgage. And you've got to pay that off. How do you how do you buy a house? So so household formations are becoming later in life. People are holding on. They're holding longer to having children, and their ability to raise then have enough money to start to buy that first house is not there, or it's later. And so that itself is putting another crimp on because you've got baby boomers that are now trying to extract some of their money from their housing. The seventy five million of them now are beginning to retire. Where's the growth in housing, but with the youth that are now saddled with fixed debt, ever mind debt that they now also have to face with health care costs, et cetera. So it's it's compounding. And quickly, suddenly this peak consumption, our ability to sustain 70 percent just isn't just is not there. 
And there's a ramifications of that. You know, we have job shortages. There's, there's, that, that's a long discussion. But, we, you know, some of the numbers, Charles, we have 48, basically 48 million Americans or 15% of the populations now on food stamps and 50 million are below the poverty line. That doesn't help consumption. We didn't have that before. We have 110 million Americans that are on welfare programs um, or work for the government, which is like 88 million on welfare, but 110, where, whereas you've got 110 million that are working age Americans that are not working. And and the remaining 95 million are either too young or, 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 or too old. So suddenly, even those who are working is has the inability to create the same levels of consumption because the others just don't have the money. As obvious as this is, Charles, and we all say, yep, there's nothing new in that. We haven't sat down and went back to the formula and says, how does this work? <laughs> it, it doesn't work anymore. It's br- completely broken and, and fractured. And this chart really shows it. You know, these changes have destroyed disposable income. And in real terms, it has been basically in free fall. And, you know, you may give 7 or 8% each year um, is significant. But in three years, we're talking 20 and 30%. Charles. And that's why in the last few years, it's become so, it's like hitting a wall. And we're presently in America hitting that, uh, that wall. So 70% level is, is simply unsustainable. Uh, comments? Yeah. No, just, uh, that's a, an excellent summary of, of that we're hitting the wall and, and we're not going to break through that wall. So we have to do something different. Exactly. You know, like trees, you know, consumption can't keep growing and, Trees eventually fall. You never know what's going to trigger it, but they just get so high and some instability comes in. Well, there's no question 70% can't be, uh, be sustained from all of these, these issues. And especially when job creation itself, Charles, has shifted from productive jobs to one that support consumption or non-productive consumption. And that is, you know, housing, retail, restaurants. These are leisure. These are all great areas, but all those are consumption. They're non-productive and having jobs in them is non-productive. So it's not helping the economy. And, and what, what bothers me the most too, Charles, is when you get this, it starts to destroy and distort the incentive in a society. We start to aspire for certain types of jobs and careers to self-actualize. And suddenly today, if I was to say to somebody, oh, you know, working in a factory, they'd look at me as though I'll be dead before I would allow, I'd go on food stamps before I would do that. Well, you know, 25 years ago, those were the best paying jobs. But they're, they're not, they're not acceptable. A lot of that work is just not acceptable anymore. And that's what I mean by the level of distortion uh, that's that's come in. And that breaks a society and it can't operate that way. And if we went back to our formula that I had up and I showed originally, you know, that the 70, uh, the current where we're at, the first line, 71% consumption and the negative in red of export and imports, forget the balance. If we took that consumption down to 55%, I don't want to make this some kind of math <laughs> quiz, <laughs> Charles, but it would suggest that we've got to get our exports up. They've just got to get the net up into something in the 12%, and we've got to get that investment up to 18%, and that investment's got to come from savings. And we can't have government expenditures, and i showing it at 19.2%. It, it currently, it's much higher than an actual fact, and if you really go through it. But it's got to be pulled back, but we can't pull it back currently without stalling the economy. So we're, we're kind of trapped in this, are we not? Yes, and, and that's why, as you started out the program, we need a market-clearing event where the bad debt, um, impaired debt's um, liquidated and um, renounced, and the price of things falls to what uh, we can support. See, that is exactly the only way out. The only way out of the gig. This chart here shows that everything's been kind of falling off from a debt as we've had non-performing loans, bad debts, people having to pull in, they're, they're maxed out. But it's being offset by temporarily offset or hidden to some degree by the, the purple air. The government's just expanded the amount of debt or, or spending, but it's non, it's, it's not producing any real kind of growth. It's, it's, it's just creating a bigger load for us to carry in the future. So the only true way out of this, um, so that you can get and incent new investment in productive assets, is at the bottom, and it's part of the natural clearing event, is you've got to have a change in pricing. 
And the way you change pricing is typically is a drop in the stock markets or equity markets. Asset values drop. Housing prices come down, which means debt default, debt jubilee, debt clearance. That has to happen. And in 2008, we made a public policy not to do that, to bail out the banks. That was a major, in the historic history books, we'll write this down, as a massive economic mistake. It was flawed. And the best I can give the government is they may have believed that if they could get a year, the economy would come back. But it can't come back because it's structurally flawed for all the reasons we went through. So we're push, we're just feeding ourselves bad medicine. And I think we all intuitively know that, Charles. But somehow we just, we just keep, every time it gets bad, we just double up, right? Isn't that what China, what Japan just did? Hasn't worked for 20 years. So the solution is to do twice as much. Right. Uh, what I call uh, doing more of what's failed spectacularly. And uh, but as as you started out in the program saying, I think, um, you know, we're eating our seed corn, you know, by by spending and borrowing and spending and not investing productively, then we're, we're eating our seed corn. And when that the corn's gone, then there's no future crop. Well, it's not all doom and gloom in that uh, there is a future, uh, but the longer we avoid the realities, uh, the bigger the problem and the more devastating it's going to be. Well, we're long past our uh, hard line as usual, Charles. Any last closing comments? Uh, nope. I think you summarized it very well. I hate to be negative on some of this subject, but I guess the fact we just avoid it like this formula is very, very telling. But we're going to be back a little later this week. And we're going to pick up on the nature of work that we talked about for four. And I'm looking forward to that. So talk to you later this week. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at GordonTLong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at GordonTLong.com.